What on earth is going on with Nikola Motors? There's been a lot of revived concern around this company, their product, and their overall business strategy after the turmoil that we've seen in the equity markets over the past couple of months. After announcing a rather disappointing quarter in the fourth quarter of last year, delivering around 20 trucks to dealers who themselves only are seeing such low demand in the market right now, investors are trying to understand whether or not EV adoption in the Class 8 space is even ready to go mainstream. I personally think it is, and although it's going to take some time for that to happen, I think patience will definitely pay in the long run. But at least in the short term, there are concerns around a startup business that is focusing solely on the Class 8 electrification race. It's not going to be an easy race to win, neither it's going to be an easy race to continue racing in because of obviously the issues around cash burn, capital expenditure, and raising money from a bear market. But I do believe Nikola has a plan to tackle all of those even though the situation looks quite grim. In this video, I'm going to exactly address those points along with understanding what are some of the uh, developing risks around Nikola's business that have raised more concern over the past few weeks. But as usual, guys, before we get into it, make sure to drop me a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button if you found some value from this video after watching it. So to start things off, let's recap where we are and where we're headed as Nikola Motors. Right now, they have produced around 258 trucks from their latest earnings call, meaning that by the end of December of last year, they produced around 258. And obviously they told us that they delivered around 131. Now, whether or not that's a good number, we really don't have anything to compare against. There is no other automaker in this space that is either disclosing their numbers publicly or is developing a battery electric class eight semi truck in the US market with their own factory in house. Tesla is doing that with the semi apparently at least, but the issue is they don't have a direct to dealer business strategy. None of Tesla semis are in inventory in any traditional dealer in the US. Instead, they have a direct to consumer strategy where they directly sell to the customers that are interested in purchasing their product like PepsiCo. What this means is that there is more uncertainty that can be created around a business like Nikola and their product if you don't have anything to compare it against. It becomes very easy to compare Nikola against startups like Lucid, Rivian, Tesla, or other companies that are producing products that are much easier to scale, albeit for a company that has much more, much more, much more capital available, north of $5 billion for something like Rivian, whereas Nikola right now is sitting with just less, whereas Nikola right now is sitting with less than $200 million in available cash. But to be honest, given the economic environment that we're in, I am not too shocked that that's the kind of situation we're dealing with. Sentiment for EV stocks in general, like I just showed this week, is at an all-time low. And there's really good reason for that. Interest rates are at 5%. But obviously, let's be completely honest here. There are some really good achievements that Nikola has done over the past 12 bonds, which are something many people did not expect them to achieve at all. Not only have they shown us the ability for them to produce trucks at scale with around 260 produced in less than nine months from a factory that did not even exist 24 months ago, but they've also shown us their ability to actually work with dealers, customers, and potential partners to their recently announced highlight business and their strategies with chart industries, Fortescue Future Industries, and GP Jewel for hydrogen procurement. And it looks like at least so far in the first quarter, they have delivered more trucks than they had in the fourth quarter of last year. Their inventory lots outside of their Coolidge facility have certainly gone down. And as you can clearly see, they have now seen a consistent output of mass 
produced tray bevs. This product is obviously their market launch into the industry and their primary product, which is going to be the hydrogen fuel cell version, is still yet to come out at the end of this year. And chances are it's going to be much easier for them to manufacture, procure, and validate that product given their base with the battery electric. And as many studies and many data points have already shown us, there is going to be a mixture of fuel cell and battery electric trucks on the road by 2030. Yes, each technology offers its own advantages, but each technology also ends up working in conjunction with each other to offer the best solution for the different types of customers they're targeting. Just like across the world, we have CNG vehicles, diesel vehicles, petrol vehicles, and we also have ethanol vehicles. Different technologies will tailor to different customers. And Cummins, Mercedes, and even Volvo have already shown us that hydrogen fuel cells are typically going to be the main player when it comes to the long haul industry, which although is not that big in Europe, is huge in Australia and in the US. And let's not forget the insane mandates that California has set out to electrify its entire fleet of 1 million class 8 semis. Not only have they announced insane tax credits, incentives, and HVIP voucher programs, but they're actually going to limit the amount of emissions their diesel trucks can emit. They're phasing out the older trucks from the roads pre-2010, and they're incentivizing at a record pace for electric solutions. The Freightliner eCascadia on screen right now is one of those solutions, but as you can see, it does not have one of the best ranges on the market, around 230 miles, and neither is Freightliner planning to develop a hydrogen fuel cell version, which will hopefully increase the total addressable market of the product. And at least so far from some of the third party reviews for the Nikola tray, the feedback has generally been quite positive. Uptime for the vehicle sits around 94% according to Nikola's own independent third party testers. And overall, the practical, simplistic cab over design of the vehicle makes it quite spacious for a day cab. Although the technology inside the vehicle is quite advanced, it is still very easy for drivers to get up to speed with how the vehicle operates, despite it having two massive touchscreens and a very simple one pedal driving experience in some cases. And when it comes to establishing a competitive advantage and a longer term moat, Nikola is definitely on the right path. They're currently with the Stage 2 DOE Hydrogen Hub project, and they just announced a new plan for one in West Valley, Arizona. This will all establish this competitive advantage where Nikola can sell the hydrogen to their own customers and spur demand for hydrogen fuel cell trucks, which obviously they also sell themselves. Because this is something that has not been solved yet, the chicken and egg problem, by any other company. You have companies out there that are developing their own fuel cell trucks and you have companies out there that are making their own hydrogen equipment, but you don't have a company that is bringing both of them together in a very asset light business strategy. Trust me, there's going to be risks with this business and clearly the market is pricing that in right now and the general sentiment around the company is doing so as well. But there is a very significant total addressable market. And when we get into an environment like we saw in 2020 and 2021, which I assure you will happen sometime soon, the demand for electrification is going to skyrocket, especially businesses like Nikola. And as for understanding the economic sustainability of Nikola, at least in the short term, Although things look bleak, there are ways for Nikola to get out of this situation, which is where they're running out of cash in the short term to be able to cover their short term debts and liabilities, which is raising concern around the business, diluting its shareholders even more and completely scaring off minority, potentially and even majority investors. First of all, that concern has been raised by what's happened with Nikola stock. You can clearly see it's now under a dollar per share, 
which is a key psychological level for many people. And now it is an unbelievable reality that companies like Nikola in the EV space are not immune to any hype in the EV sector. The market cap for Nikola Motors is now $495 million, which in my opinion is quite absurdly cheap. Now, trust me, I'm going to get a lot of slack for saying this, but Nikola's book of value per share is now higher by around 25% than where the market cap of the company is right now. For those of you that don't know what book of value per share is, a book of value for the company is essentially all of its assets subtracted with its liabilities, which is what you get as the shareholder equity of the business. And as you can see, as of the last quarter, which is the end of 2022, Nikola's shareholder equity is $526 million. It has obviously gone down over the past couple of quarters because the company has to stack up more debt and their assets get depreciated. But the market cap on the public markets is now less than the shareholder equity, which just goes to show you the absurdity of markets in the short term when their time horizon gets stretched down all the way to just 12 months instead of, let's say, the next three to five years. And unfortunately, this hasn't just been happening to Nikola. Countless of other EV startups are also facing this issue where markets are pricing in the worst case scenario, even if they're doing okay for the economic situation that we're in, where first of all, even regular established profitable businesses are getting destroyed. Look at maybe Facebook, Amazon, Alibaba, or PayPal. And then you have startups that are burning cash getting destroyed at a magnitude higher level, even though their business strategies make a ton of sense in the short term. And unfortunately, because of that perception from the market, somebody like Nikola is forced to take some of the most last resort actions, like they just raised $100 million from the public markets through an offering, which did increase their cash position to let's say around $400 million now, but it still leaves them with a small hole to fill with their total current liabilities sitting at around $383 million. Don't get me wrong, the company certainly has some ability to raise more money in the short term to dilution or institutional investors or direct offerings. And the reality is that Nikola has a lot of other outcomes as well that they can pursue in case markets get even worse in the short term. Iveco or Iveco's parent company, CNH Industrial, could more than willingly be able to outstandingly acquire all the shares of Nikola Motors that could give the company enough liquidity to continue their operations. And it would be really good for them to be able to launch a hydrogen fuel cell truck with no issues because at the end of the day a product like that is really what's going to catalyze the hydrogen ecosystem and the industry by raising awareness for the applications and value proposition of the technology and if he makes you guys understand the absurdity of markets in the short term any better remember that in september 2019 iveco invested in nicola at a series d round with a valuation of three billion dollars in the private markets Interest rates were at around 4% back then, and right now they're around 5%. That's before the pandemic market and the insane bubble we saw in the EV space happened. And the public markets right now are valuing this company at less than half a billion dollars. You guys let me know what you think about this disparity. Is this a sign of the long-term change in how startups are going to be valued? Or is this really an arbitrage play that can be used or is this really some form of arbitrage that goes to show how discounted markets are in the short term? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Take care.